Uniform circular motion. Now we're going to look at a different type of acceleration. Okay? We're going to look at acceleration for an object going around in a turn. Most of the acceleration that we've talked about so far has been tangential. Basically, acceleration going in the direction that we're traveling. But lateral acceleration, also known as centripetal acceleration, causes an object not to change its speed, but rather change its direction. Remember, this is very important, acceleration is the change in velocity as a function of time. So you can change your velocity by changing your speed, changing your direction, or changing both. Okay? Velocity has direction and speed in it. So if we look at an object traveling along this dotted line, it has two components to the acceleration. It is a transverse acceleration, which contributes to the uh, you know, the speed, it's in the same direction as the velocity, or it's in it's anti-parallel to that, so it would cause it to speed up or slow down. And the centripetal uh, acceleration, which surprisingly causes the path to curve. Now, the radius of curvature tells you how much the object is accelerating. The radius of curvature, if it's very, very small, indicates a rapid change in direction. A larger radius of curvature, for a given speed, the larger radius of curvature um, basically says that the direction is changing much slower compared to the speed. And if we go to a radius which goes infinite, okay, that's essentially a straight line. So when we look at centripetal acceleration, we can relate that to the amount of curvature that we see in an object's trajectory, but also to the object's speed. Think about it this way you're going around a turn in a car. If you have no acceleration, you're just traveling in a straight line. Even if you don't change your speed, as you change your direction, okay, you're accelerating transversely or perpendicularly to the direction of your velocity vector, and therefore centripetal, the name centripetal means center seeking, the acceleration is pointing perpendicular to the tangent on the circle. Okay? Now, centripetal acceleration, very, very simple. You can prove to yourself that centripetal acceleration always points to the center of curvature, always points to the center of a circle. Okay? Consider this green vector to be my initial velocity. My final velocity is represented by this orange. So final minus initial is this little red vector. If I put it on the circle, again, it points to the center. No matter where my velocity is, my acceleration on this curve will always point toward the center. Okay? And again, um, basically, thinking about this, here's your delta V. Remember, acceleration is delta V over delta T still pointing toward the center of that circle. Here's another way of thinking about this. Later on we'll talk about forces. Okay? Right now we're sort of hand-waving a little bit. If I had a ball and I swing it above my head, okay, and I suddenly broke the string, the object would continue in a straight line if nothing was causing it to move. But the string is pulling it toward the center. Therefore, this pull or this acceleration is forcing it along this curved line. Now, we can talk about the magnitude of centripetal acceleration as it relates to speed and the radius of curvature. Okay? Um, basically, my centripetal acceleration goes by the square of the speed. The faster you go, the more centripetal acceleration you experience. Go around a turn sometime in a car. If you go very slowly, you don't feel the acceleration. But if you go around a tight turn, your acceleration could be so extreme that everything is thrown to the side of the car, but you may actually lose traction um, and the car may skid off the road going too fast around a curve. Obviously, as R gets smaller, the turn gets tighter, you have to slow down even more so as not to exceed the acceleration that the car's tires can keep you on the road. And again, 
consider a particle traveling this sort of curved path. Wherever the curvature is, that's where, on the inside, the, acceler the acceleration points. So the acceleration points here and here as it goes around that curve. How about a car going around a curve with a 50 meter radius? It's traveling 11.0 meters per second. What centripetal acceleration would it experience? Well, here we take the speed squared, 11 squared, divide this by r, 50. Um, you know, 11 squared is 121. 121 divided by 50 is 2.42. So, quite a bit slower than the acceleration of gravity, but certainly acceleration that you would feel as you go around that turn. Um, in this case, we have a ball and a string being swung ab above the head. It follows a path with radius 0.6 meters. Every two seconds, it makes one revolution. Now, this is a little bit different. We have V right here, but the ball is going around a circular path with radius 2 pi r, okay? So V becomes 2 pi r over t, the time it takes to make one complete swing around, okay? If we square V, V becomes 4 pi squared r squared over t squared, but it's already V squared over r, so the r squared up here loses one of the r's to the r down here, and this becomes our new equation for going around a circular path, where t represents the time it takes to make one revolution. So we take 4 pi, multiply that times 60 centimeters, or 0.6 meters, divide that by 2 seconds squared, and we get an acceleration of 5.92 meters per second squared. Likewise, a bobsledder is traveling down a track going 34 meters per second. In the larger turn, they go around the turn of 33 meters with a radius, and they get about 35 meters per second squared, or 3.6 g's. That's pretty, that's pretty intense going around the turn. In the next case, the turn gets even tighter. Therefore, as r gets smaller, the acceleration gets greater, and that's about 4.9 g's. Centrifuges are used to separate different uh, materials. You can use them to separate the cells in blood, the precipitates in other types of reactions. And again, they use centripetal acceleration, where the heavier particles will experience a greater amount of force than the lighter particles. All right? A sample is placed in a centrifuge with a radius of 8 centimeters. If the centrifuge has a rotational speed of 6,000 RPMs, okay, what is the acceleration of the test tubes? Calculate the velocity. Velocity equals distance divided by time. Distance is 2 pi r. Time, 6,000 RPMs times 60, 60 seconds per minute. So we're converting from uh, RPMs um, to seconds, okay? And then from there, we calculate the acceleration is 31,000 meters per second squared, or roughly 3.1 thousand times, I should say, 3,100 uh, Gs of acceleration. And here's the acceleration of the moon around the Earth. It's on a circular path, not very great at all. Satellites in geocentric orbit actually experience a much lower uh, acceleration than we experience on the Earth. Or actually, they don't feel it. So they're weightless, but that's acceleration due to the force of gravity at that location. A CD player uh, gets about 5.78 meters per second squared. Uh, when played, DVDs rotate much faster. Uh, so their acceleration is higher. Jets in a barrel roll, um, roller coasters at most 5 Gs, or 50 meters per second squared. And if you're an electron orbiting a proton, this is how much acceleration you experience. Now, we can go into a much higher level of um, expressing uh, coordinates. We're going to maybe 
uh, just wave our hands through this because this gets a little bit complicated. But if this is our position vector going around a circle, we can represent the x component and the y component with cosine and sine. Um, again, um, this gets a little bit heavier into rotational motion, which we'll be talking about later on. Omega is the angular frequency, represents 2 pi times the frequency that a particle will go around in a circle. It's equal to 2 pi over uh, t, which is the period. So if we describe our position on a circle with this position vector right here, we can imagine the position vector rotating around, okay, um, once every period t. From this, taking the first derivative, velocity just becomes this equation right here. Taking the derivative of cosine and sine, we get uh, negative sine and cosine. And then again, taking the derivative of velocity with respect to time, we get these expressions right here. Um, again, not really important for this course. Um, this is nice to understand or be able to understand this for uh, later mechanics courses. Um, but I will point to the fact that you see this v squared is related to omega squared. And again, acceleration goes by v squared over the radius. Relative velocity, um, not much here either. With relative velocity, just understand that uh, your relative velocity is with respect to one frame of reference. You can actually um, connect your frame of reference to another frame of reference um, simply by uh, you know, subtracting um, a position vector. Okay? So for instance, um, in the frame of E, this is the position vector of A. In the frame of E, this is the position vector of B. So, in this case, A in B's frame of reference would simply be the difference between two vectors right here. And again, the same can be done with velocities too. Um, it's just a matter of saying that the velocity in one frame of reference is just dependent on the second frame of reference's velocity with respect to you. This is useful. It talks about water in, in the uh, river and how the velocity of the water in the river um, create the uh, deflection of the boat.